Amen. And if you're in junior church, you may head downstairs. Yep, junior church kids, zoom, zoom. All right, for the rest of you guys, do me a favor. Whether you have a paper book, a tablet, a phone, whatever it is that you're going to be looking at scripture at today, do me a favor, put it up in the air and hold it in the air. This is your light. This is your good. This is good. I want you to get your Bibles out. I want you to turn with me. We're going to be looking at a couple of different things. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of John. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then near the very, very end of your Bibles, a little bit before Revelation, you have this letter from John called 1 John. We're going to be looking at both of those. I have most of them on the screen. There's one passage that I do not have on the screen that I want to have you. I was going to bring the TV and roll it over, but I decided instead I want you just to have that passage right there in front of you. I'll show you what that is here in just a few moments, all right? Let's bow our heads one more quick time. Father God, may the words, the words that are heard today be your words. I pray that you would just hide this servant, Lord, behind the cross. I thank you for your scriptures. I thank you, Lord, that it is living and active. I thank you, Lord, that it is capable of coming and just doing incredible spiritual, supernatural surgery, things within us. I thank you again for all of this, for the light. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so guys, last week we began looking at the first part of 1 John at chapter 1, and we got a whole whopping three verses into it, a whole whopping three verses. And in that third verse, we, we saw this word um, uh, fellowship, and we asked ourselves the, the meaning of this word fellowship, and I promised you that we would be looking at that today. In verse 3, John says this, and you see it on the screen behind me, we proclaim to you what we have seen. We, we tell you, we, we, we give testimony to all that we have seen, all that we have heard, so that you also may have what? Okay, we're going to be here a long time. So when I ask you a question today, you just be very forthright, okay? There's not a million of us here today, all right? But I, I need to be able to hear you. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be, I'm going to get you right up to football and you don't want that. Okay, so now it says again, these are John's words. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen. We, we, we give testimony to all that we have heard so that you also may have what? Fellowship. That's awesome. Even the people online, thank you for tuning in. They even heard you as well. This is good. Guys, I do want to briefly stop here, though, just long enough to point out that at first glance, when we read this verse, at first glance, it may seem as though this word fellowship is describing the kind of relationship that John is wanting us to have with him and with the fellow believers who are in, who are in Christ. I mean, you could look at this verse and, and read it this way. We proclaim to you what we have seen and what we have heard so that you also may have fellowship with us, so that you can join us in our common belief. At first glance, this might be the way that you want to, to read this this verse, but I am telling you guys, that's not really exactly what he's saying here. The word here is fellowship. And the original Greek word for the word fellowship is this word called koinonia. And you have heard that. It's a good word. It's a word that we should probably have in our minds. So I'm going to have you say it with me. Again, it's pronounced koinonia. I want you to say it with me. Are you ready? Koinonia. This word koinonia is, is recorded 19 times. In other words, it's used 19 times throughout the entire New Testament. And it means more than just having something in common. Okay? Koinonia instead describes the effect or the result of having something in common. But not just anything in common. Koinonia isn't a, a secular term. It is not a secular word. Instead, it's a word that describes the effect and the result of the relationship we can now have with God because of our faith and because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we can see this so very clearly in the second part of verse 3. Again, backing up, it says, we proclaim to you, this is John, this, these are the fellow, his fellow disciples, his fellow followers of Christ. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and what we have heard so that you also may have fellowship. Even as we have fellowship, you can have fellowship. 
And this fellowship is with the Father. And it's with His Son, Jesus Christ. Guys, koinonia, this word for fellowship, isn't just something that, that we can experience as, as, as followers, or our fellow, um, fellow followers of, of Christ. Yes, we can have fellowship between us. But more than that, more importantly, koinonia is something we can actually now have with God, with our Heavenly Father. And we can have that koinonia, that fellowship with God, because of the fellowship, because of the koinonia that we have with His Son, Christ Jesus. So let me describe it to you this way. Let me paint it a little more clearly. Guys, when we read through the Old Testament, right? When we read through the Old Testament, how does it describe the kind of relationship that God had with his people? That's an interesting question, isn't it? But think about it for a few moments. Think about it. What did that relationship look like? Now, the relationship back in the very, very beginning, when we think uh, in the book of Genesis, and we think about the Garden of Eden, and we think about Adam and Eve, the relationship that God had with Adam and Eve there in the garden was amazing, absolutely phenomenal. I, I long for that. I long for that. It, it wasn't as though God was distant. It wasn't as though, you know, God was, was somewhere real far away. It's not as though they, they didn't feel God's presence with them because God's presence was with them. Guys, in the book of Genesis, it literally says that God would often walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening there with them, beside them there in the garden. Now, does that not just kind of blow your mind a little bit? And is that not something that you're not envious of, even jealous of, to experience and to have it for yourself? But the reality is, guys, after the fall, after sin entered the world, after sin entered their lives, it wasn't long before all of that changed. And so can you think of anyone really after this, after Adam and Eve, who, who literally met with God, who, who had a, a deep and, and meaningful relationship with God. Because the truth is, there are really very, very, very few occasions. Maybe, maybe with the exception of Moses. And some of you are thinking, yeah, but what about Moses? And yes, God met with Moses there on the mountain, and it was phenomenal. And yes, God met with Moses there in the tent of meeting. But you know, guys, even then, I really do suspect that what Moses experienced was just a shadow, was really just a shadow and not the full embodiment, if you will, of what God wants for us in our relationship with him. Do you hear me? Somebody say amen. For those in the Old Testament... I don't think God was very approachable. For those in the Old Testament, I think they, they, they constantly long for, to have more of, a, of an intimacy you know, with God. And even when they would go to worship God, you think about this, they would go to the temple and then they would worship God there at the temple and, and they would bring their sacrifices to God. But even then, they had to, 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 to allow the priest to actually give the, 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 the sacrifice on their behalf. And there in the temple, I think, was this daily or, or weekly reminder, this huge, the, the, the biggest icon showing their separation be between them and God. That being this huge enormous, nearly two and a half foot thick curtain there in the temple that separated the people from the Holy of Holies, that separated the people from the true presence of God. Do you hear me? Guys, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, did, did people have koinonia with God? I think it was far from it. I think it was far from it. And guys, that's what makes verse 3 so amazing. John says, we proclaim to you all the things that we have seen, all the things that we have heard, even the things that we've touched, all the things that we have experienced over these last three plus years. We share with you. We, we, we give testimony to you. We proclaim to you 
so that you also may have fellowship with God, even as we have fellowship with God. Our fellowship is with the Father and is with Jesus Christ. Fellowship with God. Guys, I am telling you, when John wrote these words, and I'm sure that he didn't just write them, I'm sure he was constantly teaching and, and proclaiming these, these words in, 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 in church meetings to the people of God. Guys, do you know how foreign, do you know how strange these words had to have sounded to those who are listening to John? So what made this change that John is describing? And how can, can we ourselves have koinonia, fellowship, true fellowship with, with, with God through Christ Jesus? Carol, I think, and I were talking, I think it was Carol, this past week, and, and she said, you know, Jeff, I am really, really struggling, as I know you are, she was referring to me, with the state of the church in America today. She said she was talking to, to somebody, somebody that, that obviously she, she knew, she knows, and has a, you know, relationship with, and she happened to, to bring up, you know, Christ and the church and everything, and and having fellowship and stuff. And she says, you know, I, I, I never really understood what you mean by this personal relationship with God. How can you have a personal relationship with God? What does that even look like? What does that even mean? I've never experienced that, and I've been going to church all of my life. So what does it mean? What does it look like? Well, guys, the, the truth is, John spends the rest, and in, in, in fact, pretty much the entirety of this first letter called 1 John describing what that looks like and what that means. Guys, I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Verses 5, 6, and 7. I'm even going to give you a moment to, 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 to get there. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. It's right there at the end of your Bible. And this is what John says. And I think this is on the screen behind me as well, isn't it? Okay, it's the next verse. All right, so you can look on the screen behind me. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship, this is that word, koinonia, if we claim to be a follower, if we claim to have fellowship, if we claim to have, have Christ in our lives or God in our lives, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, if we are in the light and we walk in the light, even as he is in the light, we do have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, what's the next word? This is such a big word. His son purifies us. He's not describing about having our sins forgiven. He's talking about actually purifying us from all sin. We'll, we'll come back to this. Guys, I, 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 I'm going to leave that on the screen. What I want you to do is I want you to turn in your, on your phones to John chapter 3, and I beg your pardon for this, but it's John chapter 3, and it's not verse 16 that we're going to start with. I want you to go to verse 19. We're going to look at John 3, 19, 20, and 21. Guys, in a few weeks, a few weeks from now, on Wednesday night, in a few weeks, we are going to be looking at John chapter 3. We're going to be looking at this passage where Jesus is having this incredibly deep theological discussion, this incredibly deep theological conversation with a fellow named Nicodemus. And in the midst of, of, of Jesus' talk, in the midst of Jesus' dialogue with Nicodemus, Jesus tells Nicodemus, he told Nicodemus this, and you see it there on, on your phones or on your tablets or in your Bibles. It says, this is the verdict. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. 
But men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil, they, they, they hate the light. They hate the light and they, they, they will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth, whoever truly has koinonia, those who truly want koinonia with the Father, those who live by the truth, those who seek Him and, and want koinonia with Him, they come into the light. And they come into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what has been done in them has been done through God. And the question is, well, what is it that has been done in them? Well, you go back and you look on the screen behind me and it says this. John says, this is the message that we have heard from him and declared to you. God is what? It's light. He is light. God is light. It's the same thing that we see here in the Gospel of John. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him. You see, guys, Nicodemus, Nicodemus thought that he had a correct, a right relationship with God. And the reason why Jesus was so straightforward with him was because he wanted Nicodemus to know the truth. If we claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness, we lie. We lie. We do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have koinonia. We have fellowship with one another. We have the forgiveness of sins. And, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all righteousness. Guys, for years and decades, for hundreds, thousands of years, the Israelites, they, they, they not only wandered around the desert, they wandered around the Holy Land, wandering. Looking to have that, that, that personal kind of relationship with God, that God told them about, I will be your God and you will be my people. Do you all know that was just a foreshadowing, a picture image of what Christ would ultimately do, what God would ultimately do through Christ. You will be my people. I will be your God. Now, one of the things that grieves me more really than anything, and you've heard me say this so many times, is the heresy today that is plaguing such a huge percentage of the present-day church. This heresy of trying to convince people that living in sin for a Christian is not a problem. That it's okay for, for Christians to go and indulge in this and indulge in that because, because, because of the cross and because of Christ's sins. It's a half-truth, just a, a half-truth. You guys have heard me say so many times, and, and, and let, me, let me explain myself this way. You've heard me say so many times that Christianity really, when it really, really comes down to it, is a choice. It is a choice. Following God, it, it, it's a choice. It's a decision. Even the issue of, of, of going to heaven or hell or, or, or whichever, honestly, when it really comes down to it, it is a choice. Guys, we have a choice. We, we, we can either choose to remain in, in, in darkness or we can choose to come out into the light. But guys, let me warn you very, very, very clearly that if you come out into the light, if you walk out of darkness and come into the light, your life will be changed. It cannot help but be changed. Sin will be exposed, the Bible says. Fellowship will ensue, the Bible says. And then thirdly, what is so often neglected and not preached, not spoken about. But thirdly, he will begin the work of purifying you, purifying you from all of your sin so that sin will have no place, no desire in your life. Can I have a witness? 
So do you see how it really is nothing more than a matter of choice? I mean, and the, and the question really is this. For those of you that are here today, for those of you that are watching online, that the question really just comes down to this. What do you want? If you choose, if it is your desire, you can remain in darkness and not have your, your sins exposed. You, you can continue to live the lifestyle that you desire. It is your choice. God does not make robots. He does not want robots. He has no desire for robots. The choice is yours. For those of you old enough to remember the name Billy Joel, <laughs> right? He wrote a song, and I remember for the longest time I thought the song was really, really great, really, really good, and then I actually listened to the words of the song, and I said, I am done with this. I want no Billy Joel anymore in my life. Billy Joel, um, whatever tribute band, probably not going. Probably not going. I'd rather laugh with the sinners, he says, than cry with the saints. And guys, he is certainly not alone. He is not. I mean, you look around because the world is filled with people who would rather live their lives, their current lifestyles as, as it is, than come out into the light where their lives would become radically changed. The truth is they don't want their lives to be changed, let alone radically changed. But guys, my friends, if... It is your desire to have a fellowship. And maybe, maybe, maybe you have been coming to church for a long time and it's just like, you know, but I, I don't really feel like I have that, that koinonia, that, that relationship, that, that intimacy. Guys, if it is your desire to have koinonia with God, if it is your desire to put your life into God's hands and, and trust that what He has for you is better than anything that this world can offer. Then he will come and he will have fellowship with you. He will forgive you of your sins, but he will also come and purify, purify your life. Because it doesn't just say that you will be forgiven of your sins. It says that you also will be purified, purified from your sin. So listener, beware. Listener, beware. If you enjoy your sinful lifestyle and don't want to have it messed with, if you, if you don't want to, to, if you want to continue on living the kind of lifestyle with the freedom to go and do this and to do that and all of those things as you have in the past, then do not step into the light. Yes, you may have that sinful lifestyle only for as long as your time on this earth lasts. But you can have that if that is your desire, if that is your choice. God will not force you into something that you do not want. But if you believe the God who created everything that exists, if you believe that the God who, who created all things, if you believe God who created you, has better for you than the things of this fallen world. You can choose to trust him and step out into the light where your life can and will be radically and forever changed. The choice is yours. Now let me point one more thing out. There is another interesting thing that John points out here. In verse 8, John also realizes that there were and there continue, even to this day, to be people who think their lives are, are, are good enough and, and, and worthy enough to enter into fellowship with God without having to step into the light. And to this, John says this, if we claim to be without sin, if we claim not to have sin in our lives, 
we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, stepping out into the light, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins. Now somebody tell me what the next word is. He will forgive us of our sins and... So he's talking about one thing here, and he's getting ready to say another thing. He will forgive us of our sins, and he will purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Guys, I cannot tell you how many times over the past 25 years uh, plus of, of ministry, I cannot tell you how many times that I would talk with somebody, a neighbor or somebody, try to witness to them, and their first response is always, yeah, you know what, Pastor, I am good. I, I'm actually a very, very good person. I do not have sin in my life. I am not like the people that we see on TV every night on the evening news. I'm not like the people that we read about in the paper. No, I, I am I'm going to be in heaven because I am a good person, they would tell me. The world is filled with that. Guys, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 cannot be more clear I mean, it just cannot be more clear where it says for all. Who? All. Somebody say it with me. All. For all have sinned. All. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Guys, as I said earlier, I really, really, really struggle with some of these churches who try to tell people that their sin doesn't matter to God. If they do not matter... If our sins do not matter, then why does it say that our sins will not only be forgiven, but they will be purified? We would be purified from our sins. We will be purified from our sins if we step out into the light. Why do so many so-called Christian churches today want to deny the transformation that the Bible so clearly describes? The transformation that takes place when we simply come into the light. A transformation that we cannot do ourselves. A transformation that takes place only when we step out into the, in, into the light. Guys, in reality, we still live in a world where the, where the devil speaks and seeks to impart his half-truths, even in churches. Guys, years ago, my, my brother, he still lives on the east side. We're, we're trying to get him out of Scaryville and move him up here to paradise. But, um, you know, he, he lives not terribly far from uh, Post and, and 10th Street. Um, Scaryville, I mean, it really is. And, and um, the thing is, you know, when my brother bought that house, you know, 20, 25 years ago, it was a beautiful place. Maybe it was even 30 years ago, crying out loud, I think it was. It was a beautiful neighborhood. It was a great place to live. And um, he bought this house, and he, he gutted this house. And he made it really, really nice. Um, the, the nice thing about the neighborhood was it was a mature neighborhood, so there were trees, like, all over the place, right? And a beautiful, mature trees hanging over the house and stuff. There was one neighbor, and he knew that I roofed houses. In fact, I think we put a new roof house, a new roof on my brother's house. And the neighbor saw us, and he's like, hey, I, I didn't know you guys roofed houses and stuff. He says, I got some major, major problems going on over here at my house. He says, can you help me? He says, I'm afraid I'm going to have to tear it off and, and, and spend, you know, seven $8,000, you know, putting on a new roof. Doesn't sound like fun, does it? I went over there, and, I, and I, I looked at his house, and even before I crossed the street to his house, I knew exactly what the problem was. The guy didn't need to spend $8,000 on a new roof. I could see it immediately. He had all of these trees all around his house, and, 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 and the trees just hung over his house and shaded his house. It was really, really, you know, kind of lovely and everything. It was beautiful, these mature trees. But the problem was he had all of this algae and all of this moss and everything growing all over his roof. And it made it look like his shingles, you know, were, were all like breaking up and, and crackling. He, he thought from the ground that, all of it, that, that what he was looking at was his all busted up shingles. That wasn't the case at all fact of the matter is the house just needed to step out into the light the problem was the house was 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 dealing with a with a, a sin problem if you will an algae problem and i told him i said listen you don't need a roofer you need an arborist 
Good thing I, I, I grew up on a farm where I can help you cut trees. So yeah, I'll be over there in a couple of days and we'll help cut these trees back. And we went, and I never did step foot on his house. Not until 15 years later when he did need a roof. And I did rough that house, by the way, afterwards. But uh, all we did is we came and we brought the chainsaw. And we didn't cut the trees down. We just trimmed them back. Just trimmed them back. Got it so that that sun could bake on that, on that house. And you want to know what happened? If you step into the light, God will purify. Will purify. Ten days later... We had a, a rain, and it was kind of windy and stuff. I went over to my, to my brother's neighbor's house like a day or two after that, that, that big stormy rain and stuff. And his house looked almost brand new, the roof anyway. It had all flaked off, blown off. The rain just rinsed it off. Guys, I, I, I'm telling you, there are so many people in churches across the the world, but I think especially here in America today, who, who just do not have that kind of fellowship with God that we're talking about here. Certainly not the kind of, of, of a fellowship with God where, where, where God is coming in and, and, and purifying their life. Oh, they go to church, they do this, they do all of these things, all of these staples. You know, I got to say my prayer before I, I eat my food. I, I, I need to read, you know, the verse that Carol, you know, we have a church app. You should get, download our church app. It's really, really awesome. You know, Carol sends out a verse in the church app every, uh, every morning, and we read the verse of the day, and and we get fed, and, you know, you click on it, and you, you can end up reading more and stuff. And, you know, I do all those things. I come. I even come on Wednesday nights where Pastor Jeff gets really, you know, down and deep into it. But you don't have that, that kind of koinonia that's being described here. What does it mean, guys? What does it really, really, truly mean to, to walk in the light? And we're going to continue to look at this. As John continues to describe it big time, big time. All I know is this, Doug and Endura, you guys feed me. Our house is, is still kind of in shambles and stuff, right? So you invite us over to your house and you cook for us every now and again. You say, get that kitchen done for Amy. She deserves a good kitchen soon. Hurry, get it done, get it done. We go over to the house and I sit down and I eat that food that is at her house and suddenly I feel really, really good again. And I realize that the, the, the junk that I'm eating out of the pantry, you know, because, and, and Amy still cooks, believe me, she does. She, she does an amount of Is Amy even here with us? She's downstairs? I don't know. All right, yeah. Well, no, she does, still does a great job. But I'll tell you, when I eat healthy and right, it is amazing how healthy and right I feel. And when we are reading and absorbing, listening, looking at what is good and what is right, what is righteous and what is healthy, it is amazing, isn't it? How good and right and righteous. I am so glad that the ladies are, are doing not just one Bible study, but two Bible studies. That's fantastic. Guys, March is our time. Thursday night will be our, our time. And we're going to be going back and forth between my dad's house and, and Doug and Jean Hall's house sometime around late March. And they'll be playing pool and eating food and all those good things. But they'll also spend a good hour in Bible study as well. Wednesday nights at this church, we get fed. Unless I go on a little tangent and get a little sidetracked and derailed, which I've been known it to do. We will look in God's Word and we will get fed and we will bathe and bask in the light guys I encourage you come get in the light be in the light as often as you can come get fed bring your kids make sure your kids are getting fed that your kids are in the light that your kids lives are being transformed I want to be in the light as he is in the light. I want to shine like the stars in the heavens. You remember that good old song? Let me pray with you guys.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we, um, we've spent some, some time digging pretty deeply into your word again today. And uh, Father, I know that, that the scripture is true where it says where two or more are gathered in your name, that you're here with us and your spirit is moving and speaking to us. And I suspect, Lord, that even as I've been challenged just by considering these words again, Lord, from your scripture this morning, I know that I'm not alone. Father, um, we live in a world today that's so incredibly dark. And we have neighbors, Lord, that we have grown to become friends with. And the reality, Lord, is as, as we step into the light and, and bask in the light, Father, we know that that friendship will just turn into a love and a longing to see good things in their lives. Lord, we live in a world today that is so dark with people all around us walking around in darkness, crashing into things, bumping into things, falling on their faces, picking themselves up only to fall again. Lives so filled with stress and anxiety today, unlike any time, I suspect, <laughs> unlike any time really perhaps in all of history. And yet you have given us light and you want that light to, to shine in us. You want us to, to, to come along others and to bring them into the light. Lord, help us, Lord, all the more to understand, to know exactly what it means to, to be your people, to be in the light, to walk in the light as you are in the light. And may we shine like the stars in the heaven. And may you have your way in our lives that we may have the, 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 the true joy that we would find the, the true purpose, Lord, for which we were created. Not just the relationship that we have with you, but this koinonia that we would have with others as well as a result. Lord, make our joy complete. Even as, as we are in the light, help us to draw others into your light as well. Make our joy complete. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, I will tell you, last Wednesday night was phenomenal. We really had a great night. The, the, the dinner was good as always, but um, God really showed up. It was a great Bible study. Um, you're more than welcome to go back. Look at it online. Find it online. It's easy. Um, also, we are probably going to have a dinner church this Wednesday night. Um, a little bit of snow never hurt anybody, okay? People up in Elkhart, South Bend, uh, Michigan, they deal with it all the time. I promise you we will do everything we can to have the sidewalks, the driveway cleared. If we need to, we will take the golf cart and we will drive out, do a donut in the parking lot, pick you up, maybe do another donut in the parking lot and bring you up to the door, all right, so that you can make your way up easily. You will, you will be well fed, both physically and spiritually. God bless you guys. We'll see you guys soon. Look for the uh, email tonight or tomorrow with the newsletter. It's a good newsletter again. Thanks, guys.